Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Have you ever wondered what God is like or what Jesus was all about or how you get saved and what getting saved means anyway? Well, if you've ever felt embarrassed to ask, please don't. I really want to help you understand our big, amazing God. And a great place to start is a little book that I wrote called The Basics, God, You, Jesus, and Faith. And here's more good news. If you're always on the go and don't have time to read, you can now listen to The Basics as a podcast series. Just search for The Basics with Pastor Mike Novotny wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Back in 2013, a high-speed train was carrying 247 passengers across Spain to Santiago de Compostela, where thousands of Christians gather every year to celebrate the festival of St. James, a disciple of Jesus whose bones they say are buried in that place. The train was about two and a half miles outside the city when it rounded a curve at 120 miles an hour, which wasn't good because the speed limit around the curve was 50 miles per hour, and for good reason. Because the train was going too fast, eight of the train cars came flying off the tracks, slammed into a concrete wall, and 78 of the passengers died. The two train conductors lived, and one of them immediately called for help. I've, I've derailed, he said in his phone call. What do I do? He asked. And as he did that, a lot of people started doing all sorts of things. The other conductor got out and started helping survivors. The local firefighters happened to be on strike at that moment, but they decided to pretend that they weren't. And they decided to go and help. Hundreds of people lined up to start donating blood because when there's trouble, it's, it's an important time to do something. And the truth about trouble is that Jesus believes you won't have any trouble finding it. You know, when Jesus invites us to call upon me in the day of trouble, he's implying that we will have days that are kind of troubling. When he tells us to ask, seek, and knock, he's implying that we will have times when we'll be seeking something important that's missing. When he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I think you know what he's implying about how you're going to feel sometimes. And sometimes that burden you carry is the fact that you just crashed a train that you were driving. Or you just disappointed someone you love again. Or it's a sudden loss of a loved one after a long struggle with their health or into the arms of someone who apparently excited them more than you did at the moment. Or maybe someone hurt you. And whether it was recently or a long time ago, it hasn't healed one bit. Or maybe your life with all of its demands, tasks, and surprises is just moving more quickly around the next corner than you're comfortable traveling and you're scared of the crash that seems to be inevitably coming. Or maybe it already happened. Or maybe you look at the world today and the direction it's going and you get really scared for our children. You know, there are any number of reasons you might feel troubled by something, and if you are, then well, let's slow down the train and stop at the book of St. James where he tells us exactly what we should do when life gets troubling. In James chapter 5, verse 13, he says this, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Why? Because the Jesus who invites us to pray in Scripture and commands us to pray, well, he did something. He came, he lived, he died, he rose to assure you that God is always listening. In James chapter 5, after James writes, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. He goes on to say this. He says, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us, he goes on. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. I want you to imagine that your doctor told you that you were going to die within 18 hours, unless you took a particular pill every night before going to sleep. You could never miss it once, or you would die. Do you think you would ever forget to take that pill? Probably not. 
because taking that pill is too important. It has everything to do with living. James is making a similar point about prayer in the section that I just read. He urges us to pray in such a wide variety of situations because prayer is a powerful difference maker in our existence. If you just look at verse 15 in that chapter, there's an important word that comes up three times in that verse. It's the word will. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Those things will, not might, happen. God takes definitive action when we pray, and he uses the prophet Elijah as an example of this. James mentions the time that Elijah prayed that it would stop raining, and there was no rain on the land for three and a half years. During those three and a half years is also when Elijah prayed that fire would come down from heaven to show the prophets of Baal that Elijah's God and not theirs was the real thing. Elijah's life is proof that prayer is powerful and effective, just like James says that it is in that same chapter. But there's something else that we know about Elijah. Elijah, at many times during his ministry, felt depressed, alone, tired, and discouraged. This is what James means when he says that Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was even convinced at one point in his life that everything would be better if he would just die. And maybe some of those things have described you too. But if any of them do, don't take that as a sign that there's something horribly wrong with you. Take it as a wonderful reminder that, like Elijah, you are someone whose prayers God will listen to. In James chapter 5, James urges us to pray, of course, and he assures us that God will answer our prayers. It's good news. However, it's important to know that there are two prayers that God does not answer. Firstly, God does not answer a prayer that is never prayed. One chapter earlier in the book of James, James gives us a very simple explanation as to why certain important things might be missing from your life. You do not have, James says, because you do not ask. God, of course, can do anything. He can answer any prayer, but God intentionally withholds blessings that he could easily give us sometimes because he's waiting for us to follow his instructions to to ask, to seek, to knock, and to confidently call upon him like he tells us to. And the reason why is because when we make the time to pray, we're saying something. We're saying that we need God with us as we go through something which means that when we don't make the time to pray, we're saying that, in a sense, we'd prefer to go through a situation without him. And when that's the case, God often allows that to happen. He allows us to go through a situation without him, without his help. Hopefully so that we learn to never do that ever again. The other time God will not answer a prayer is when it's not a prayer that is offered in faith. And there are two parts to a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith is, number one, a prayer offered by someone who has faith in Jesus as their Savior. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that's even with our prayers. And number two, in this beautiful section on prayer, James brings up confession and sin to emphasize that a person cannot offer a prayer of faith while also at the same time holding on to a sin. In other words, we can't keep doing something God says we shouldn't and we know we shouldn't and also expect that God is going to reward us by then giving us whatever we ask of him. This is why James tells us to confess our sins to one another. In verse 16 in chapter 5, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. He wants us to do this so that we can help one another identify anything in our lives that's keeping God from listening. And and so, well, I would like you to do that. I would like you to go find someone right now and tell them the most sinful thing that you thought or did this week. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm not going to have you do that. But I I do want you to do something. And something that at first will seem to have nothing to do with prayer. I want you to think of your favorite color. Okay? You have it? When I tell you, I want you to speak the name of that color silently. 
In other words, I want you to move your mouth as if you were speaking the name of that color, but without making any sound. You will say the name of your favorite color, but if anyone's around you, no one will hear it. You think you can do that? I'll give you an example. So my, uh, my favorite color is... Probably were able to tell that my favorite color is blue. But I gave you an example of saying that without actually any sound coming out. So now I want you to try it. Without making any noise, I want you to say the name of your favorite color. Go ahead and try it. I'm assuming you were able to do that. And if you were able to do that, then I want you to do the same thing again. But this time, I don't want you to speak the name of your favorite color. I want you to silently speak a word or phrase that describes your favorite sin. Maybe favorite isn't the right word there, but, but it's a sin that's on your mind most often. A sin that makes you feel most ashamed. Something about your life that you know needs to change. James urged us to confess our sins to one another, which can only happen out loud, of course. He's not opposed to us confessing our sins privately to God, but there's something good God does when we confess our specific sins to a Christian sister or brother. I want to give you practice doing that in a safe way here. So are you thinking of a particular sin? When I tell you to, I want you to silently say what it is to me. Move your mouth as if you were speaking, but without making any sound. You think you can do that? Why don't you try? Go ahead. I'm guessing that for some of you, that's the closest you have ever come to telling somebody about that sin. And I'm guessing that for some of you, even though no one heard it, it felt kind of good to get that out. Carrying around a weight like that on your heart without ever lifting it off your heart can be an incredibly heavy burden. Verbal confession to someone else is a way God gave us to release that burden. But it also does something else. Confessing your sin to a Christian you trust gives that person an opportunity to remind you that Jesus died for that sin too. And You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Do you remember the train accident in Spain I told you about recently, the one that happened in 2013? The train that went too fast around the corner and ended up crashing? Francisco is the name of the conductor of that train. He's the one who called for help. And after he was on the phone and he said, and he announced, I've derailed to the people he was talking to. He said, what do I do? And then he said one more thing. He said, I hope there's no one dead. But of course there were. There were 78 of them. And that's why he hasn't driven a train since. He doesn't trust himself, and the train company didn't trust him either. He wasn't allowed to drive any more trains after what happened. And if we don't trust certain people with trains, does it surprise us that there are certain people God won't trust with the resources of heaven? I mean, isn't that what prayer is? It is the privilege of using the resources of heaven to change the world's direction. And who does God trust with the resources of heaven? James chapter 5, verse 16 does not say, the prayer of anyone is powerful and effective. But instead it says, the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Which, by the way, does not mean that the righteous person who prays will always get everything for which he's praying. Case in point, there was no one more righteous than Jesus. When we know regularly set aside time to get away from the to-dos of life so he could both listen to his father and pray to his father in heaven. And yet there was one time he asked his father to do something that never ended up happening. On Monday, Thursday, Jesus was weary, he was troubled, he was burdened. He didn't want what he knew was coming. 
the same reason you wouldn't want to be in the mess of a train that flew off the tracks in Spain. The piercing sting of iron rubbing against your bones and strangling the sensitive nerves normally protected by your skin isn't a pleasant sensation. Take this cup from me, he begged. But his father said no, because his father heard another prayer from his righteous son that evening, one that Jesus taught us to pray to. Your will be done. Your will be done. And we know he meant it. Because the next day it wasn't a train that was crumbled up in a pile of destruction. It was God's only son. It wasn't metal cars that were mangled, but the human skin he had put on. It wasn't 247 passengers screaming for help. But just one innocent man whose father answered his screams with silence, so that we could see once and for all that what God willed and wanted more than anything was you and your salvation. That's why James wants us to confess our sins to one another, in fact, so that we can remind one another that the punishment that brings us peace was upon him And by his wounds, we are healed. Or as it says in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, through the obedience of the one man, the many are made righteous. Righteous. And whose prayers are powerful and effective? Yours are. You who are sometimes weary, burdened, broken. You who live in a world that is so troubling. And we see its pain in the eyes of our oldest adults and the most vulnerable children. We feel it in the tears that run down our skin. But God has given us a gift that does and will make an incredible difference. Are any of you in trouble today? Is anyone you love hurting? Take a moment right now, my righteous brothers and sisters, and pray. Walmart has been known to have some good deals from time to time, but the deals that some shoppers found at two Walmarts in Louisiana some years back were unlike anything they had ever seen before or might ever see again. It was a Saturday, and because of a computer glitch, limits on everyone's food stamps cards were erased. In other words, if someone normally receives $100 in food stamps per month, the registers at Walmart told them that they could spend much more than that, as much as they wanted, in fact. With uh, with text messages and social media posts, word very quickly spread about what was happening at Walmart, and within minutes, these two Walmart stores were filled with so many customers that police had to be called in to keep order. Pictures of the stores showed shelves that were completely empty and shopping carts completely filled to overflowing because customers believed there were no limits on what they could receive. And whatever you think of what they did, <laughs> that is an exciting feeling. Like consider how generous God promises to be with all of his children when we pray to him. And how great that makes us feel. You know, test me in this, he says in the book of Malachi. Test my generosity and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Your heavenly Father knows what you need, Jesus said in Matthew 6. And to those who seek first his kingdom, all these things will be given. Ask, Jesus said, and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Well, now you are filled with grief, Jesus said to his disciples on the day before he died. But go to my father, and he will give you whatever you ask in my name. Whatever you ask. In other words, there's no limit on the good things you can receive from him. There was a limit, however, on the Walmart food stamp shopping experience. After a couple of hours, the store suddenly announced that each person's spending limits had been restored to their food stamp cards. And do you know what happened when they did? 
Well, what do you feel like doing when you fill your shopping cart with prayer request after prayer request after prayer request? But the voice from above seems to be telling you that you're not going to get any of it. How motivated do you feel to keep praying? When you ask for something important, like, like a sickness to leave, or a bit more peace or stability, or a job that gives you the ability to provide for your family, or that God would remove a difficult burden, and he doesn't give you whatever you asked him, even though you prayed in Jesus' name, even though he must be aware of the grief that it's causing. How long do you keep praying to God when you seek and seek and seek, but only find nothing? You ever feel like leaving the shopping cart in the middle of the aisle? And just walking away? Because that's exactly what the Walmart shoppers did when they found out they weren't going to receive everything they were hoping. They stopped shopping. Dozens of overflowing carts were just abandoned in the middle of the aisles. In other words, you wouldn't be the only person to ever feel like giving up is your best option. But Jesus reminded his disciples one day that it isn't. That you always have at least one better option than giving up. And that one option, after you have not received whatever you're asking for, is to ask again. And again. And again, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus told his disciples a story to show, to, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Here's the story he told. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about people. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time he refused, Jesus went on, but, but finally the judge said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about people, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, Jesus finished, he will see that they get justice and quickly. And who will get justice? Did you notice that? God's chosen ones. God will bring about justice for his chosen ones. And who is that, you might ask? That's you the cross of Jesus, God chose to love you and never stop. The one that we cry out to in our prayers is not like the judge Jesus mentioned in his story who neither feared God nor cared about anyone. He's the God who used a cross and some nails and the blood of his own son to show exactly how much he cares for everyone. And if a helpless widow can get justice from an ungodly judge simply by asking again and again and again and again, then what do you think you will receive when you test the generosity of the one who has promised to open the floodgates of heaven for those who call on him? Keep asking. It will be given. Keep seeking. You will find. Go to the Father, and he will give you whatever you ask in Jesus' name. Maybe not immediately, maybe not until the next morning or until after 13 or 99 years of waiting. But the God who has already gone to such great lengths to give us a place where nothing important will ever be missing ever again, certainly always knows the very best ways and the very best times to answer the prayers of those he has chosen. Do not give up. Keep praying.